it affects families, it affects businesses, it affects uh, churches, it affects governments, it affects everyone. We all are searching for money and uh, it's all driven by the economy. And there are people who controls that sector. Most of it is in the uh, hands of, uh, there is in the Babylonian system, it's controlled by the Babylonian system. And, um, and uh, many children of God are, have been uh, chasing, wanting to get hold of this economy, of this uh, sector, but they've been struggling. They've been in the fringes of the economy. How do we tackle this sector head on? How do we transform this sector so that it can transform other sectors? A lot hinges on the mountain of economy, of business, of finance, of investments. He who controls that mountain controls politics, controls education, controls governments, control virtually everything because money answereth all things. Money answereth all things. So we're gonna be talking about this interesting topic uh, uh, today. Uh, we have a number of in, 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 imminent panelists for uh, in particular that are gonna be sharing, giving us insight on how we can deal with this mountain and, and ensure that the children of God gradually take over and control. Remember we, uh, the, the, the instruction is occupy until I come. We know that all these resources belong to God and at some point in time, they have to return to him. And he will do so through me and you, through us and through institutions such as GBR and GFFG. And uh, we need to focus and be uh, purposeful in our, our programs to ensure that not everything remain the same as we found it. And um, we are the light, we are the salt, and we have to transform the environment and make it better. So before we start our program, as usually is the case in GBR, which is a Christ-centered organization, God-fearing organization, and we start our programs with prayer. And because, of course, uh, you know, in the book of uh, uh, Psalms 127, it uh, says, unless a man, um, as, unless uh, uh, God builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. So it's very, very important that we put God first in everything we do. And GBR strongly believes in that everything centers, starts, enters, starts and end and center around God. So we're gonna start our program with a prayer. We're gonna go to Botswana now and ask uh, His Excellency, Mr. John Kauya to open this program uh, with a prayer. Your Excellency John, are you there? Yes. Um, You're welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you. Um, I would want us to, as we are praying, to just uh, think about Exodus 19, verse 5 to 6. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time and opportunity you have given us tonight to sit at the feet of Jesus and to hear the word of God, the word of God from the mouth of God through your servants that you have ordained, appointed and anointed to speak the Rema word for this hour and for this season. We ask that your servants that you have appointed tonight will release life and healing and to us as your servants, the royal priests of God for this world. Let the words bring life and spirit, power and fire that will propel our hearts and lives 
to move forward as kings and priests of the Most High God. We ask you that you will reveal and release and equip us with the keys, the principles, and tools that we need for life and for godliness as we continue to reign as kings and priests in all the seven mountains of society that you have planted and called each one of us to be as light and salt in this world. So Lord, it is to this end that I commit every speaker this evening before your throne of grace. Let them find grace that they need in time of need. Let them speak words full of life, power, healing, to transform us into a Christ-like people of God, to become kings and priests of God, so that we will learn to obey your voice indeed and keep your covenant, so that we indeed become a peculiar treasure unto God above all people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation unto God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you very much, Excellency, uh, Mr. John Kauya, all the way from Botswana. Thank you very much for that prayer, a powerful prayer indeed. And um, the question is, how do we land this aeroplane? We've been flying in prayers as Christians, uh, praying for things to change, for economies to change. And um, how do we land it? How do we ensure it manifests our prayers become reality? Where do we start? And thank you very much. Before we start with our presentations, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask us to play a short DVD of GBR uh, to uh, introduce GBR to those who are joining us for the first time. I would like to welcome everyone who's joining us uh, 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 in this session. And in particular, I would like to welcome our panelists who are gonna be sharing words of wisdom. And uh, they are, I will introduce them in detail when I call them later on. Uh, the first panelist will be Mr. Lebu Raulane from South Africa, who will deal with the advantages and challenges of business finance. The second one will be Mr. Keith Tripp from the United Kingdom, he's based in London will deal with the role of Christians in creating the new economy. What kind of economy do we want to see? The third will be uh, Honorable Minister, Senator Manoba Kumalo from Eswatini, uh, who will deal with the potential of churches in developing the world economy. And the last one will be His Excellency, Jonathan Ball, the MD, Managing Director of Africa Eden Project, uh, who uh, has a project that will revolutionize Africa that can change economies and create actually more than 2 million direct jobs and many indirect jobs and create SMMEs and opportunities for many entrepreneurs and SMMEs. So we've got a very uh, fascinating uh, program. And the last one will deal with the practical transformation of, of businesses and of, of economies uh, for God's children. So I'm excited about today. So we're gonna ask the, uh, the, 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 uh, the technical team to put a, a brief DVD of GBR so that people can know what the Global Business Roundtable is about. And then we will then immediately move on to our presentations. The Global Business Roundtable was established as a global discussion forum, a support network and a prayer group for people in business and various professions, and has a God-given mission to focus on the holistic development of a person in line with God's plan for his kingdom. GBR being a public benefits organization always wants to empower as many people with information, with knowledge, with wisdom, so that they can better make decisions for themselves, their families, their businesses, and their ministries. It's centered around, you know, faith, but it's not necessarily church. Lorsque j'ai écouté, je me suis rendu compte que c'était ce, en fait, à quoi j'aspirais depuis longtemps. J'ai à cœur l'Afrique depuis des années, le développement de l'Afrique, 
l'émergence de l'Afrique, le réveil de l'Afrique. The aim is to help members to grow spiritually, to grow intellectually, to grow their networks and participate in trade and investment opportunities, to participate in mentorship and coaching programs, and to expand their businesses. GBR's objectives is about coming around the gifts of the anointed men and women of God and facilitating and equipping that so that that gift which is of God can go forth and do exactly what God called it to do. Back when I didn't know Global Business Roundtable, I was just relaxed. Like I, I didn't feel the need to learn more about uh, foreign markets, you know, investing in other countries. It is a platform that is helping people go back to their original state. And the original state was to dominate the earth and make it a better place. Since its launch in Johannesburg in 2009, the Global Business Roundtable has impacted on hundreds of lives around the world. We're really wanting to see expansion into countries, into universities, into prisons, into all sectors. 2020 will mark the dixième year of GBR. Et il faudrait que toutes les infrastructures, la structuration, que ce soit au niveau des pays, au niveau des régions, au niveau des continents, soient effectives pour que les ressources allouées, pour que tout le processus puisse être efficace. They will transform Africa and the rest of the world. In fact, our footprint now is in many countries in the world. Eight years after its launch, this God-focused organization has a presence in the following regions. The Southern African Development Community, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa. Here is a vehicle that can be used to make sure that when people say Africa is the next best thing, it's the next best thing for Africans. We have undertaken to be the vision carriers of Global Business Roundtable in East Africa by appreciating that it's a kingdom mandate that God has given for a very clear reason to liberate this generation. I see GBR going to places. I see GBR in Nigeria capturing the young and the old. Le GBR, c'est un esprit d'ouverture, c'est l'esprit de, de l'amour, c'est l'esprit de, de, de fraternité. It is actually giving the empowerment of the African people and governments to economic higher standard of, of living through God, and, and, and that is unique. Europe. I was very surprised, positively surprised, at the, uh, at the size and the reach of GBR and its capacity to communicate and to federate so many people around the table. And North America. It may have started local, but now it's global. And, and I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for men and women everywhere. GBR is like God's gift to man. Eu creio que isso vai transformar a GBR está dando essa plataforma e alcançando países, as nações que querem essa transformação para um impacto social na educação, segurança e uma questão de reino, porque o reino de Deus abrange todas essas coisas. I believe that uh, if it's starting from Thailand, Bangkok, it's really easy uh, that we can spread a GBR uh, spirit. Uh, to other country in Asia. Thank you very much, Technical Team, for that brief uh, uh, DVD of the Global Business Roundtable. Uh, GBR is Christ-centered. We love God and we fear him. And uh, we love uh, our people. We love God's people. We love our neighbors. It focuses on holistic development of God's people. That is why today we are having this session about economy, finance, and business. In the morning, we were focusing on spiritual development, praying for nations and praying for, for sectors. And uh, tomorrow we'll be dealing with politics. The other day we'll be dealing with education and intellectual development. So we we'll look at a person in totality uh, looking into the spirit, body, mind, and soul. GBR is multinational, multi, uh, uh, multi-denominational, multicultural, multilingual, 
and multiracial. We are in every nation, currently 82 nations, and our plan is to be in all the nations of the world. We believe in God because that's what is God's promises upon our lives. Thank you very much for joining this session. We're gonna start and um, we've got uh, four panelists. The first two have uh, 15 minutes each. The last two has 20 minutes each. And the first uh, speaker is His Excellency M M Mr. Mulebukheng Raulan. He's an experienced investment professional with a demonstrated history of working in the development finance, investment banking, and private equity industries. He's skilled in origination of deals, investment analysis, valuation of companies, in accounting, in financial modeling, in investment research, and general corporate finance. Uh, he's, he's, a strong, he's a strong professional with a, with a bachelor of uh, business science and focused in uh, finance honors. And he also has a BCom accounting a degree from the University of Cape Town. He also did advanced taxation and advanced corporate law and securities law diplomas. Mr. Raulamne is the head of Mpilo Capital, which is a subsidiary of Sakunoto Group Holdings. He is based in South Africa. Over to you, Mr. Raulane. Your 15 minutes uh, starts now. Your focus is, is on um, advantages and challenges of business finance. Your 15 minutes start now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. GBR convener. Thank you for the introduction. I do look forward to discussing some of the advantages and challenges of business finance with the excellencies tonight. Good evening, where I am, it's slowly rolling into the evening. I would like to greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. I must say, I really, really enjoyed the worship service and I look forward to more of it during the prayer camp. Looking at the advantages and challenges of business finance, it's a little bit of a strange world, that world that I live in, because I'm going to come here tonight, I'm going to give you some views on how things are, but the reality is that there are exceptions to every rule. Everything that I will be saying to you tonight can be viewed differently by the next person. So really tonight, the real value of the presentation is genuinely in the discussion that we will have afterwards because there are little nuances here and there that we can discuss for each unique situation. Onto the next slide, please. Tonight, what we will look at is the why, the what and the why of business finance. We may not go into detail, but just a high level of why that sort of industry is necessary is something that we will look at. We'll consider the few different types at a very broad scale of business finance that is available out there. Following that, we will on one side of the spectrum just look at equity in a little bit more detail. I'll explain exactly what that is. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we will look at debt in a little bit more detail. And I'll explain a little bit of what that is. I'll also have a little bit of a discussion around something called mezzanine finance. It may be a word that is unusual to some of us on the call, but no worries. I will explain exactly what it is. The next slide, please. When we're looking at a business, capital or money is needed to pay for business expenses. Now we know in a business, in theory, it generates income or revenue. 
and it incurs expenses. So capital is needed to pay for those expenses. So at the, at the beginning, capital may be needed to actually start a business. And this may be, depending on the type of business, to purchase assets, to purchase materials, to employ people, to rent premises. Capital is needed for the running costs in that business. It may well be some time before that business generates any revenue whatsoever. And before that revenue is generated, some money is needed. There may be other reasons why capital is needed in a business. Let's assume a business is operating already. Capital may be needed to diversify a product offering. So maybe there's a new customer trend or a new customer need and the business does not have the, the money inside the business already to take advantage of that opportunity. Capital may be needed to be raised for that reason. There are other times where capital is needed to boost cash flow in a business. And this is to help a business survive a difficult period, such as the pandemic that we are going through globally. In a lot of instances, the income that is normally earned in a business is not quite there in the same way or in the same quantities. So capital may be needed at a time like this. We in our business have seen a great need for capital over the last 12 months or so compared to before merely because of the coronavirus pandemic and the associated lockdowns. And then there are some markets where competitors are constantly updating their products. They are constantly changing their products, constantly trying to get ahead. And capital may be needed to develop new products. Capital may be needed to market those new products. And in a, in a very big way, that, that is when capital is needed in a business in, in most businesses out there. Next slide, please. When it comes to capital, there are really two broad categories of capital. There's equity and there's debt. The two sources are different in various ways, such as what is called seniority, which I'll explain in a moment. There are riskiness, to the people providing the capital, the cost of that capital, so how much it costs the business to bring in that capital, the sources of finance, et cetera. So there are many different ways of defining the difference between debt and the difference be, uh, between debt and equity. For tonight's purposes, I'll define it in terms of their seniority. What do I mean by that? All capital that is put into a business is ranked according to its seniority. On the one end, there is what is called senior debt. This is typically from a bank. And what this means is that the most senior person in that business is the first person to claim on the net assets of the business. They're the first person. If something goes wrong in the business and the business has to close down, the most senior person is the person to claim on those. On the other end, completely opposite to debt, you will find that there is equity. Now, equity is the very last person to claim on the liquidation of the company. So if something goes wrong and you need to sell off the assets of the company, the ordinary equity is the person who is the last person to claim. Now, because of the spectrum, that's being presented over there. There are different levels of riskiness in the type of capital, both from the perspective of the business and the perspective of the capital provider. The least risky of those is the person who is most senior. The person who is most senior is the least riskiest because they get the first claim. The, ris the riskiest type of capital is that ordinary equity. Now, equity is someone who has a final claim on the shares of a, of a business, while debt is someone who has the first claim on the business. You'll see that it's been represented as an arrow. What it actually means is that there are types of finance that sit in between the debt and equity. 
what you're seeing there is a very simplified form. You have something called mezzanine. For those who are in the construction industry, the word mezzanine actually means a, a middle floor in a building. It's not quite on the first floor. It's not quite on the second floor. It's somewhere that is in between. And it is, some, it is a similar definition when it comes to finance in business. There are various types of mezzanine finance. For example, there's something out there called preference shares. Another type is something called convertible debentures. These sorts of sources of capital have uh, equity-like features as well as debt-like features. So we like to have fancy words in the finance world. So we call that mezzanine and we try and make sure that we can cover all of the different features in one, in one, in one instrument. Now, what about a grant? Where does a grant fall into anything like this? So a grant is actually just an injection of income into the business. It is not a claim in any way on the business. And often the grant provider has simply put the money into the business and is looking at, um, and is not looking for any claim after that in a typical way. Now it's a pity because SMEs, not only in South Africa or in Africa, around the world, SMEs are the biggest job creators in general, but they are the ones that struggle the most to access capital. They struggle the most because they are in reality, the riskiest types of businesses. They are the ones that are most likely to fail out there. And on top of that, they are the ones that have the least, the lowest cash buffers in their business when something is needed for cash. We'll talk a little bit more about ways of accessing finance. Once we have a little bit more detail on the two main types of capital. Next slide, please. Now let's look at equity. On the one hand, equity is something that may give away control, but really it has a lot of advantages in a business. It's relatively quick to access. This is relative compared to debt. Equity is what I like calling very patient capital. Equity is someone who comes in and takes shares in a business and is willing to wait can wait five to 10 or 15 years before they are able to gain anything in the business, any sort of return. Equity partners tend to be very long-term in a business. There's actually no obligation typically to repay equity. There are no interest payments in equity. So in other words, there are no periodic payments coming out of the business when looking at equity. And then, the business can grow if there are equity partners introduced into a business. But there are risks that have to go with equity from the perspective of the business or the business owner. First of all, bringing in an equity partner actually reduces that business owner's shareholding. So the business owner, for argument's sake, owned 100% all of the business. After introducing an equity partner, that business owner typically owns less than that. And if you bring in equity partners in a business, it is then, it, it, it is then possible that there is conflict in a business, in, in between the equity partners. The potential for conflict is always there because we are all human and we may see things a little bit differently, but normally a business is expected to bring in equity partners that share a similar vision. Another challenge when it comes to equity is that there is limited availability of equity finance. So when it comes to accessing it, where you would want to look at is you'd want to look at the people around you, the people that you know personally, but the people around you may be limited in how much money they are able to invest in a business. And so we'll look at debt in a moment. It is sometimes better to be looking at the debt side. These people should be people that have the money available, but sometimes it is not available. And the last challenge I want to point out is that the equity investors are typically the last people to claim on a business, which means that equity investors typically always lose everything when a business fails. 
Next slide, please. Let's look at the debt side of the spectrum. Debt, the key advantage is that you can get significant amounts of debt. It is not as limited as equity. The debt can typically be used in emergencies, depending on where you have got the debt. And then the debt typically has what I like calling a low cost of capital. That means that it's the cheapest type of capital typically out there. The challenge is that there are periodic payments that need to be budgeted for and made. So that would be on a monthly basis, on an annual basis, you need to repay that money. It is an obligation on the business. And debt is difficult for new businesses. Equity was difficult for SMEs. Debt is even almost impossible for SMEs. And debt, because of the payments that need to be made, it actually increases bankruptcy risk. Because of all the cash that has to go out on a periodic basis, the risk of not being able to pay that means that the business could be bankrupted. Where should you look for debt? The first place to look is the local banker. They usually know the business. They know the transactions that are happening in the business. But if you're not a business that is able to access the local banker, the next source to look for is what is called other niche financial institutions like development finance. So development finance institutions will be in, other, in, in typically any country around the world and they will be quite niche. The trick with accessing those is that one needs to know what niche that development finance institution is with. And then there are other specialists when it comes to debt that are not development finance related and are what I just call other sources of debt. So I would encourage a little bit of discussion. I can see that there are some questions coming already and I do look forward to engaging with everyone on the call. Next slide, please. I do look forward to engaging with everyone around some of the nuances, around some of the, the, the challenges that are faced by business owners when it comes to business finance. I've just given them on a high level. I'm well aware that it could be a lot more detailed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency uh, Raulani for that uh, presentation on sources of finding. Uh, the key ones and the familiar ones we know as business people is equity and debt. Equity is when you need cash and you're running a business, as Mr. Lewo explained, and, um, and uh, you get somebody to invest in your business and take shares. So then you don't have pressure of paying back that money uh, monthly or yearly. So the person just have to wait for profits. A practical example, if His Excellency Babs wants to, if uh, say my company, Sakumnoto wanted cash and His Excellency Babs says, uh, I can invest and buy 20% in your company. Yes, 200 million, and then we take it and then we give him 20% shares and that's it. And then we have no obligation to pay him monthly or annually. We only have to pay him uh, a dividend every year when the company declares dividends. Yet debt is cash uh, that uh, you get uh, that you don't, you, you have to pay every month or every year. And uh, you don't give away shares, you don't lose value uh, because the, the key thing about shares, your company may be small now, but when it grows, the value of the company grows and the value of the shares grow. We've seen that uh, in many instances. We've invested in many businesses on our side and we see the value of our shares grow all the time. That is why we, 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 we do not give shares in our company because uh, we know uh, that it's a, it's a growing company and therefore uh, it would be more expensive uh, 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 to give shares than just borrow money and pay it on a monthly or on an annual basis. So those, those are just simple practical example about what His Excellency Mr. Raulani is talking about. So when you do business and you think about structuring, how you grow your company, that those two options really, uh, um, you borrow money from the banks, which you pay every month or every year, or you get your family members, your business people to invest in your business. You don't have to pay them, but you work together to grow the company and the value of the shares grows, and then they're entitled to a share of the business and the dividends 
when the dividends are declared. And I'm trying to be simplistic uh, uh, here. And um, I think that's, that's that. We've got a chat box. Uh, you post your questions there. At the end of the session, in the last presentation, we're gonna open that chat box and ask somebody to read those questions. And uh, our panelists will answer them uh, for you. So, and, uh, and if we have uh, some time, we'll also uh, take some hands, people who can just come in and, 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 and speak. Our next uh, panelist is uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Keith Tripp uh, from the United Kingdom. And he's got an MBA and Master of Arts, Arts degree, a diploma in marketing and is a chartered marketer. Keith is a committed Christian with a passion for helping people fulfill their godly given purpose. His experience spans international business management, business startups, church leadership, property investment, and theological education. He started his career as an apprentice engineer, during which time he gained a higher national diploma in mechanical engineering processing to a senior fluid mechanic, mechanics engineer role before moving into his international career focused on sales, strategic marketing, business development, and general management. Keith worked for Dunlop Aerospace and James Walker to help them move from a fragmented management of a portfolio of companies, each with their own strategy to be a globally networked organizations with multiple, with a single strategy implemented locally. This achieved effectiveness, efficiency, and learning through matrix management, centers of excellence and global knowledge management. He was heavily involved in the local church leadership until 2000 when, it told, when God told him to stand down and to focus on ministry in the workplace. He has fulfilled many voluntary roles and is currently a trustee and a director of voluntary sector centers who are focused on providing leadership in the battle for effectiveness, efficiency, and economy in the volunteer sector. He has recently completed an MA in Applied Theology and had a short-term contract with St. John's College, Nottingham, to explore the future for theological education, which highlighted the need for effective theological and practical training for the very high uh, proportion of Christians who have not been called to pulpit ministry or the local church. He has an online workplace ministry, ministers course to help individuals understand and relate to the biblical understanding of God's intention and Christ's ideology for work, the workplace and trade. Keith is using his business theological training combined with his leadership experience, both business and the church to offer a practical approach to excelling in the calling of God. He is a leader of GBR in London, uh, in the United Kingdom, is working with uh, His Excellency Richard Fleming there. Welcome, Your Excellency Keith. Your time starts now. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, greetings from the UK. And uh, thank you for the invite to speak uh, today on the, the role of Christians in creating the new economy and what should that economy look like. I'm going to give you just a, a lot of high level thoughts, which you're gonna to need to take away with you and spend time with God to get that internal illumination about what it means in your context. I need, first of all, just to give some uh, background so that you understand from where I'm coming from. So if I look at Hebrews chapter one, verse three, and this is from the uh, Amplified Version, the sun is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being the brilliant light of the divine and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his father's essence and upholding and maintaining and propelling all things 
the entire physical and spiritual universe by his powerful word carrying the universal the universe along to its predetermined goal so our almighty father has a predetermined goal and we are on that journey with him with that in mind our christian engagement in the creation of the new economy is absolutely key and if we start to look at some of the principles that we see in the word of god like the year year of jubilee so the leveling process the command not to reap the edges of the fields so that we we start to understand the the dealing with poverty issues uh, so so that we understand that actually wealth generation is good when we look at jacob and joseph and many others in the word of god in fact getting profit is is good but we also have to be aware that we've been told not to build bigger barns and just store it up it's for use not for storing and uh, in fact if you look at the, uh, the the story of the talents jesus was very clear he called the person who didn't make a profit wicked and lazy and i don't think we want god saying that to us at all ever so we've seen the impact of COVID-19. Um, it's caused the worst ec economic decline for 100 years. Worldwide, it's circa 5%. Uh, the UK announced a couple of weeks ago that uh, it was a, a reduction of 9.9%. .9%. We've seen a significant increase in world debt, and that's brought about many unprecedented fiscal policies that we're seeing governments, governments implement. We've seen an increase in unemployment. And uh, the, the IMF say there are now 90 million people in extreme poverty. So clearly, something isn't quite right. And if we look at two principles, in fact, our Excellency CIPO uh, quoted this first slightly earlier. Uh, unless the Lord builds the house, the, the builders labor in vain. And if you look at when the people tried to build the Tower of Babel, God came and said, no, you're not going to do it. I'm actually going to scatter you and I'm going to change all your languages. And he prevented them from them building the house. And of absolute importance is that we take hold of the principle that we seek first the kingdom of God. And this is, again, is the amplified version. And it's, you know, seek after his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God. And so all that I am speaking about is based on the foundation that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has a plan and a purpose for each of us to fulfill. And so there are four sectors that I'm going to very, very briefly speak on this evening. The first, workplace church. And in workplace church, we need to get away from separating sacred and secular. You cannot separate the two. The second being innovation. We need to recognize that God wants to demonstrate his creativity through us displayed as innovation. And we need to share and to network. We need to learn God's intention for the body of Christ to work together and share with one another to, in maximizing success. And all with the aim of bringing community transformation. So what is Workplace Church? In fact, it looks like any other organization, for profit or not for profit. It's retail, it's manufacturing, it's services. It is like any other organization. 
on the outside. But on the inside is where we see the difference. We see the need to demonstrate Christian ethics. I studied business ethics for my MBA and I studied Christian ethics for my uh, MA in Applied Theology. When you look at business ethics, it's very consequential. It's what's the end result. And one of the main tracks is the benefit of the greatest number. So it's not what you do, but it's the results that matter. When you look at Christian ethics, it's what ought you to do. It's what's the goal, the, what's the character of how you do it, and how is your conduct in doing that? So you're looking at what the end result is, but you're looking at it from a different angle. We need to develop discipleship programs. Many, many people, the majority of people, are actually called to workplace ministries. And when I say that, what that means is they're not called to run a local church and be a, a, a minister or a pastor in a local sh church and or be part of the work that's going on there in, in that employed way. Most people are employed in the workplace and actually are called and given a purpose to fulfill as workplace ministers. And we need to train people to be more effective at fulfilling their calling. We need to create opportunity in those organizations for worship and to share what God is saying so that we can hear from God. We can give him the predominance and we can make sure he is the CEO of these organizations. We need to learn how to intercede by praying in the spirit. This is, again is a very big subject, but actually in essence, the father has a plan and purpose. He's given that plan and purpose to Jesus. Jesus has appointed apostles, prophets, etc. He then speaks to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and speaks with us and empowers us, gives us the understanding, and we pray to the father. And because we complete the loop, we know we're praying the will of God so we know it will happen. We need to intercede for our businesses. And we need to create opportunities for people to operate in their gifting. Everybody is gifted by God. Everybody has a purpose given by God. And we need to be looking for those opportunities to put in play those people in their gifting. I'm going to give an example throughout of how voluntary sector centres has worked with uh, governance ministries, mansion gardens, and actually urban develop as well in creating employment, in, their in looking at developing now apprenticeship schemes and establishing workplace minister qualifications and ordaining people as workplace ministers and supporting them in that activity. It, it's a fundamental different way of thinking. Innovation, we need to be looking for the need and letting God inspire us. He's the creator and he knows the need and he will give us the understanding of not only product, innovative products, but also innovative ways in running companies and structuring companies, in structuring finance in order to be successful. God will give the solution. I used to work with someone 30 years ago. He was the production manager and he always found a solution. And I said to him, how do you find these solutions? And he said to me, very simply, I just asked God. God is the one who will give solutions. And we need to follow his leading. We in BSC, Voluntary Sector Centers, have been doing some development work for the last two or three years where God has shown us a need for lower cost social housing, lower cost care housing, lower cost uh, charity centers. 
And we have now worked with a R&D company to develop some boards to manufacture houses and properties for significantly lower cost than is current, but meeting all the regulations. And that is God who's given it. But we needed to invest 500,000 pounds so far. We've got about another uh, six, 700,000 pounds to invest. And we didn't have the money, but God moved to structure voluntary sector centers. And it's a long story, I can't give it you now, to actually change our business model, change what we were doing and start getting an income of a profit of between two and 300,000 pounds a year. It enabled us to move forward with the project that God had spoken to us about and we didn't know how we would do it. But it's very important that none of us see ourselves as our own little island. Jesus said, this is my body. And God has ordained the body to use their gifts and work together. In fact, I believe that God wants to do something even more globally. And again, this is a massive subject, which I cannot go in, into in detail. But I believe he wants to have a matrix type structure for the kingdom, where he's got his apost local apostles and he's got projects that are working right across countries, right across regions, and in fact, working globally. It's a different way of operating. It's much more complicated. But I believe that if we listen to the Father, we will know which way to go. There's a, there's a scriptural verse in Joshua says, you will know which way to go because you've never been this way before. Look out for those divine connections. He wants to give them to us. But we have to do something with them. It's no good meeting someone and then not following it up and working together. Look for the guidance of God and see the teams that he wants to establish globally for us to be effective in the kingdom. Make sure you're looking to sow, invest, give away. I believe it's a change of time. It's a time for kingdom sowing and kingdom reaping. What does that mean? It means you will sow and someone else will reap, but someone else will sow and you will reap from what they sowed. It's a change of time in the kingdom, I believe. I'm just conscious of time. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to move on. The example there is about how God has put together uh, a number of companies and all the experts required to move forward. What we're doing here is we're saying we are aiming towards transforming communities. We need to address poverty. We need to start seeing these workplace churches generating wealth in being different internally from lots of other companies and actually reaching out and impacting communities. That's addressing poverty, but it's also about capacity building, capacity building communities, interest groups, uh, people, building them up to be able to be successful in themselves. And we need to help people, communities, charities, organizations to grow wealth. That group of companies that I've mentioned are actually now going to be building low cost social housing and governance ministries will supply workplace ministers to operate and work with the tenants to help them out of poverty into a capacity building position 
and then into wealth. It's an ongoing process. So, to conclude, Workplace Church, please remember Christian's role in, cre in, in creating a new economy is to establish workplace church organizations, follow God-given in innovation in product, process, and character of their organizations, sharing and networking specifically, but not exclusively with the body of Christ, with the objective to transform communities. And I leave you with one final thought. Do not let the spirit of poverty persuade you that it's wrong to become wealthy because that will limit the expanse of your community transformation. So expect God to give you vision and expect God to give you the direction of how to move towards the fulfillment of that vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Keith, for that powerful presentation. And um, on um, Christian engage, Christian organization to engage, and Christians in general to engage with workplace ministry. And uh, many people have believed that uh, you have to be a pastor of a church to make an impact in the lives of others. And yet, in the organization where God called you, planted you, whether it's in business, whether it's in education, whether it's at, at, um, uh, in any career that you are in in government, uh, you are a minister of, of the gospel there. You have to minister uh, and with what you know, with what you have. Uh, to other business people, if you're a business person, you don't need to seek to be ordained as a pastor uh, of a church and start a church and, and, um, and stretch yourself in areas which you, you're not called upon. But you, you, you emphasize four sectors, work, work, workplace, church. You said we can't separate um, ourselves from the environment in which we operate in the, the workplace. Uh, innovation is critical. Share and network. Uh, your growth is determined, is determined by your networks and is determined by your sharing. The more you share, the more you grow. And you spoke about that lastly to say, uh, you can reap from the seed you have not planted. Somebody plants, you reap, but you plant, somebody else reap. So it's, uh, that is why we are a body uh, that must work uh, together. And you, you mentioned the last part about transformation of communities. And you showed us that project that you involved in, that the, the, the entire purpose uh, at the end of the day is how we impact the lives of others how we win others to Christ and how we transform communities by creating jobs for them, taking them out of poverty, uh, uh, restoring their dignity, ensuring that we support them with uh, skills, training, information, so that they make best decisions for themselves and their families. That was very, very powerful. Thank you so much, Your Excellency Keith. And uh, there are questions on the box. I think we will read them at the end. And, uh, and then uh, we'll open up uh, to, for the panelists to respond to those questions that are being uh, posted on the chat box by uh, the past people who are attending, uh, the excellences who are attending the session. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Keith. And we're gonna now move to the uh, third panelist. I made a mistake earlier on. I said it was uh, former mi uh, minister, uh, ma uh, minister, uh, Mangoba uh, from, from the kingdom of, of Eswatini. And you know, he's speaking, the Honorable Minister, Senator Mangoba Kumalu from Eswatini. He will speak during the session on the mountain of uh, government politics and leadership. But tonight we have His Excellency, the former Minister Nono for Ezekiel Mulefi. And he's a practicing Christian born again in 1975 through the minister, Ministry of Christ for All Nations. 
is married to Daisy Molefe, and they together have four grown up children. He is a trained youth work practitioner of over 22 years uh, of public service during which he held various position. He served in a number of national, regional and pen Commonwealth organizations during his public service career. On leaving public service, he joined the family business AMB University College, a private tertiary provider uh, uh, as a director 2000 and from 2000 to 2003. In 2004, he joined active politics and uh, joined a political party contesting constitution representing Botswana Democratic Party as the parliamentary candidate for Silebi Pikwe East constituency and won the general election. He contested and won the subsequent parliamentary elections in 2009 and 2014. He served as the minister from 2008 to 2019, holding a number of portfolio, portfolios, Ministry of Lands and Housing, Ministry of Transport and, and Communications, Ministry of Infrastructure, Science and Technology, Ministry of Infrastructure and Housing, and finally, Ministry for Presidential Affairs and Public Administration. He has served in the National Committee of Scripture Union Botswana and served as Chairman of Youth for Christ Botswana. He also supports other nonprofit civic organizations. He is passionate about civic and community development, social justice, economic empowerment uh, of the marginalized. Uh, in, in 2020, he rejoined the MB University College. Over to you, Your Excellency, uh, former Minister Nono for Ezekiel Mulefi from Botswana. You have 20 minutes, Your Excellency. You, you, you have 20 minutes now. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, the convener and moderator for tonight. It is indeed my pleasure and honor to have been invited to participate in this discussion. First and foremost, I think the opportunity accorded the audience and the broader Christian community is uh, actually an educating, broadening and enriching experience. Part of my presentation has been taken by Keith. One of the key principles, which I think as the Christians, we have to appreciate and understand is the fact that we have dual citizenship. We are of the, not of this world, yet we live here. That is what John 17, 15, says when Christ prayed for his disciples. He says, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. Therefore, it places a responsibility on the Christian to live a godly life on earth, to meet the social and economic requirements of the local environment. It is therefore important that as we look at and examine the environment within which we live, that we must contextualize our life and our practice as Christians. Rarely do you go around the world to find a country which is officially declared a Christian state. You rarely find that. But when you look at the other religions, for instance, they are up, up front about their faith. But because Christianity has learned to be tolerant, we've ultimately become overtaken by other religions in terms of prominence and visibility. What is important for me, I think, is that as uh, Christians, we can no longer be spectators. We can no longer be bystanders. We cannot be aloof. 
and the platform that has been created by GBR and the projection of a global fund for Jesus is an opportune moment for us as Christians to galvanize support and anchor these two facilities institutions on the very shoulders of the broader church. And of course, the church is diverse. The church, in my view, is fragmented. We have the Pentecostals, we have the Evangelicals, we have the mainline uh, Protestant uh, churches. We have new emerging ministries. And therefore, we have not found convergence as, as the Christian church at a corporate level. We have continued to exist in our individual tests, which therefore weakens our opportunities and our potential. Let us put on the slide one, please. I came across this slide just about three days ago. It says, how do you expect to get out of poverty and to develop your community if you still love church more than education and business? Poor African communities have many churches in one village, but they do not have even a single factory that is producing something and creating jobs. In China, there are more factories than churches. Chinese spend the whole night working and producing jobs for their children, while Africans spend the whole night praying and fasting for marriages, end of quote. I think this is a serious indictment on the church globally. And the opportunity provided by GBR should be used to turn the tide to ensure that at a community level, we see more education, we see more business. We deal with issues of poverty because poverty affects the church members. That is at a corporate level. At an individual level, it is therefore important that we personally take responsibility to associate and invest in GBR so that the fund for Jesus as envisioned would grow and expand and develop capacity to address the very issues that uh, Tracy talks about here, that we need to develop education, we need to develop business so that the cycle of poverty is addressed and dealt with at a community level. For instance, in Botswana, the early missionary churches, the London Missionary Society, when they came into Botswana, they built uh, schools. The Seventh-day Adventists built a hospital. Dutch Reformed Church built a hospital. The Lutheran Church also built a hospital. And the Catholics built secondary schools. That was the then missionary work. We therefore have to expand it because the complexities of contemporary uh, economies requires us to address a different level of need. Yes, education still remains important. Business still remains important. We therefore have to work around providing capacities at a community level. Reference was made by Keith on what Christ said, I was sick, I was in prison, I was naked, we did not extend help. And Christ wasn't talking about himself. He was making reference to our own fellow men and women. Therefore, we need to deal with deprivation as is today. And the platform created by GBR and the fund should therefore support the initiative that 
demystifies and distills what Tracy uh, has presented here, which I call an indictment on the church. Yes, there is the church corporate, corporately. Then we have to deal with individuals within our denominations. As we break denominational barriers, the individuals within the denominations have to find opportunity to invest in projects and programs which seek to address education, business, which seeks to address issues around poverty, unemployment. It is important that the early day uh, teachings which we all imbibed, where we were all taught that it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of the middle than for a rich man to go to heaven. That religion, that teaching has to be contextualized so that we do not live in poverty because we are scared, as Keith said, of being rich because we will miss heaven. We have to live comfortably here with the resources and capacities which God has given us for enjoyment and for our own prosperity. Slide two, please. When you look at the religions and populations, statistics shows that there are over 2.3 billion Christians which is just a little over 31%. Islam, 1.9 billion. The secular and other religions, 1.1 billion. Hinduism, 1.16 uh, billion. When we look at this as an opportunity, we then have to identify prospects and opportunities which the 2.3 billion, if we are to produce goods and services for this particular segment of the world population, would they be interested in buying the goods and services? How best can we attract the 2.3 billion as potential customers to businesses we can uh, generate. Of course, what is important also is to raise the conscientiousness of this 2.3 billion to understand that they owe it to themselves to associate and procure from businesses run by their own uh, people. When you look at what the, 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 the Jews do, and uh, also within the Muslim uh, communities. They support one another. They support each other's business. And that is the drive which we need to bring to the fore, to conscientize Christians to believe in themselves and to appreciate the fact that God has given them the wealth of nations. And the wealth of nations can, can be taken up through procurement of bus from businesses which are run and owned by Christians. And of course, as, uh, when I talk about Christians, I talk broadly about anyone who professes to be a Christian. Of course, there are those differences in terms of interpretation of what Pentecostals are, what evangelicals are, and these doctrinal differences also continue to divide us uh, further. As GBR grows and develops, grows in outreach, the extent to which prospects to have a foothold in the financial markets remains in focus or should remain in focus. Slide three, please. Of course, these definitions we are, we are familiar with. When you look at those uh, listed 
companies and businesses. It is been reported that these 20 companies are part of a, a, a group of companies, 1,318 companies, which collectively represent about 20% of global operating revenues. You may think they are 1,318. The researchers from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich further looked at these numbers and identified that or revealed that the 1,318 companies are part of group of companies, 147 of them, and these 20 are part of that. Therefore, these companies control 40% of the entire uh, network of uh, financial resources around the world. And as Christians through GBR, we have to find a model which will uh, cut a little piece from the remaining uh, percentage so that we too as Christians can have a foothold in the financial markets so, so that we are able to support the businesses, Christian businesses. You look at the Islamic religion, they have Islamic uh, banking. We therefore have to develop models which will sustain and support the businesses, the models which Keith earlier on uh, spoke about. It is therefore important that as we, 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 we traverse and scale the world of business and economic growth, we look at what the church can do. Yes, at a macro level, there are prospects. There are also prospects at a micro level. We can initiate at country level, small cooperatives, which cooperatives, the sum total of their productions and services can cumulatively reduce or have an impact in terms of growing the economies of our countries. We therefore have to look at those prospects which can be dealt with at a country level, at a regional level, and at a continental level, and at a global level. It is in my view that as we look at these opportunities, we must also look at what also Keith talked about earlier, the work ethic of the Christians. We must take ourselves serious the opportunities as presented by GBR should at a country level be developed, internalized, propagated, and embraced so that we are able to grow these uh, organizational capacities. A few years ago, I met a Swiss uh, philanthropist. He used to fund startups and on a number of occasions, some of the companies or businesses failed. What he then decided to do, instead of putting in money, he decided to buy shares in a, a particular business when he is convinced that uh, that particular business has prospects of success. What he then did was to headhunt a business manager for that particular business to manage it, run it, and ultimately the sponsor of the business idea would buy him out after two, three years or as would have been agreed. And I think that could be another model where we support and strengthen capacities of, our, of businesses. We've talked about monitoring and mentoring. Uh, the next slide, please. It is important that as we develop this capacity, the values of GBR and the GFFJ 
should be broadened, should be sold, should be extended, such that people are able to have a buy-in as potential investors. We must also be keen to build coalitions with other like-minded consortia so that we broaden the capacity. The, 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 the Lebo spoke about the, the, the sources or models of uh, uh, financing. It could be equity participants or participation. It could be uh, management contracting. We have to look at how best can we support businesses drawing from the capacities within uh, the, 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 the GBR family, where we can send a particular person or persons to mentor other uh, emerging uh, business persons, coach them, and handhold them as part of the support uh, structure or mechanism which we want to, 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 to entrench within the organization. And of course, like I said, we can procure international talent where necessary or when necessary and to deploy it to some of the projects which we believe require agent assistance and have a great potential to, to succeed. I spoke about uh, Christian cooperatives at a macro and micro level. It is an opportunity that could be explored and supported. Identification of high impact projects with good returns. The financing models have been discussed. It is therefore important that as Christians, we look at resources within as Moses was asked, what do you have in your hand? He had that working stick and that working stick became a tool for him to intervene in the lives of the children of Israel in Egypt to lead them to the promised land. Therefore, we also within the organization have a wealth of human resource uh, that can be used to support our endeavors. And finally, Proverbs 29, 2, it says, when the Russians rule, the people rejoice. Rulership in this instance is not just confined to government. It is extended to all spheres of life, whether it is in education, it is in business, economy, issues of prosperity, health, when the Christians are in charge of all these services, you are definitely assured that you will get quality service, you'll get value for money, there will be no shortcuts, and everything else will be done above board. I therefore believe that GBR and GFFJ have a great potential, and therefore it only calls, on our, calls for us to avail ourselves to support and roll our sleeves because the laborers are few. And out there, there are plenty of laborers to come into the harvest field. I thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Honorable Minister, for that powerful presentation. You touched all the, the key points that um, sometimes we avoid. We think that they will make us uh, politically incorrect or Christianly incorrect. And you first said we, are, we have the dual citizenship. We are kingdom citizens, and yet we are earthly citizens. And yet uh, our loyalty should be first to God to do things uh, in an honorable way, righteously. And you said few countries in the world are brave enough to officially call themselves Christians. We say the Christian religion is the most tolerant. It accommodates everything, it's flexible, we don't stand by our values, by our principles. You say we are the most fragmented and uh, into different uh, uh, groupings, evangelical, Pentecostals, mainline, independent churches, and that this has weakened the church. This has made our voice uh, uh, weak, that even though we, we are the largest uh, population, 35% of the world uh, groupings, is, it's Christians, and uh, we have little influence. And, and the ones that have fewer, that are fewer, uh, have more influence in terms of controlling the economy. 
and uh, the many churches have embraced poverty. They think poverty is closer to godliness, and they've uh, shunned education, they've shunned wealth creation, they've demonized everything that is, and this is the lies of the devil. We, for we know that the God who created the heavens and the earth, who owns everything, and uh, is the most holy God, and yet he's the most wealthy God, and uh, the silver and gold belongs to him. So you can be holy and wealthy. And, um, you know, there's a saying which says, um, money uh, has no character of its own. It assumes the character of the possessor. If it's possessed by an evil person, it will do evil. If it's possessed by a righteous person, it will do good. So money in the hands of Christians, of God-fearing people, can transform and impact many lives around the world. So, and money is a tool to fight poverty. And uh, you, you showed us a slide of the uh, companies that uh, control substantial part of the uh, world economy, and, uh, and which is very, very uh, sad. And, uh, and uh, we need to raise companies that are born again, that fear God, that love God, that whose purpose is to transform lives. They make money aggressively, but they invest in developing communities and whilst spreading and, and the message of the gospel. So, and uh, I think that's, that's very, very important points that you touched upon. And uh, the, the issue of work, work ethic, the issue of embracing education, the issue of uh, ensuring that we invest in, ourself, in ourselves, develop ourselves in order to be able to serve others better and to be effective and to take control of all these sectors of economy are very, very important and central. And this is part of a GBR mandate, part of GFFJ mandate. And God has already prophesied that GBR and GFFJ are established to correct these wrongs, to take over these mountains and to ensure that they operate in a godly uh, fashion, in a godly system, that we put in place uh, the systems, the patterns, the structures that are kingdom systems that are aligned with what God had created these sectors for. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for this powerful presentation uh, that you've shared with us today. You've touched all the key points and many more, and, and they reso resonate with, with us and with the, the theme of uh, uh, this uh, camp, reigning as kings and priests in all sectors of society. And today in particular, we're speaking about the mountain of economy, of finance, of business, of investments. How do we as Christians come together, work together to ensure uh, we influence uh, the sector, we take over and we control so that we can do that which is just and righteous and transform the lives of people. And when money is in the hands of the unrighteous, you see corruption, you see greedy governments, you see greedy private sector, you see uh, people using resources to oppress others, and that has to change. Money can be used in a godly fashion. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I'm sure we're all posting our questions there. And uh, we're going to go quickly to the last panelist and then take the questions uh, and, and then proceed with our program. Our last panelist is um, His Excellency, Mr. Jonathan Ball. He is the Chief Executive Officer of African Eden Project. Uh, Mr. Ball has a 35-year distinguished retail, wholesale, management, and marketing career. Jonathan is a lateral strategic thinker and has a, has a keen sense and understanding of global influences. He has a strong operational background and leverages technology to achieve operational excellence. Jonathan studied, at the, studied law at Vets University and subsequently completed an executive development program at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town. 
Jonathan had a significant career at Pick and Pay and was awarded the Executive of the Year Award in 1992 and formed part of the company's marketing committee. As a director at Pick and Pay, Jonathan was responsible for the development of farms and supply chains with the requisite ability to supply directly to the sophisticated retail environment. Jonathan is considered a change agent in rural Africa, seeking to find ways of improving the living of all farmers and the rural communities that they serve. Your Excellency, Mr. Jonathan, and we give you time now, your 20 minutes begin now. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is indeed a wonderful, wonderful blessing for me to be here today and sharing uh, with you and trying to give a share of what I think we can do within Africa. You know, I am first and foremost, I'm a Christian. Secondly, I'm an African. And those two are, are indivisible. And purposely what I would like to, to, to discuss today um, I'm, I'm a, a hard-nosed uh, Christian. I'm looking at opportunities for us to create the change that brings about opportunities for people to find their faith. So that is very key and, and uh, fundamental in terms of, of uh, where I am today and what am I going to be discussing. But principally what I'm saying is, is that we can create an African economic independence um, and and we're going to use agriculture and food security as the opportunity in order to be able to do that. Africa is right now the, the poorest continent, yet we are in fact the richest. And we're the richest for a number of reasons. One is we have the youngest population. Secondly, we have 75% uh, of all minerals still yet to be mined are still below the surface. And three, we have the absolute climate to be able to feed the world. And that is key and, and, and fundamental. Next slide, please. I say you can only be poor in the absence of hope. The reality is, is that not having money in your pocket doesn't make you poor. But if we have a, a faith or a uh, people that we can talk to or an idea or a decent education, we have the ability to be able to change our position. Next slide. I think that everybody will agree that Africa is desperately in need of some hope. Now I want to ask the question, is access to healthy, nutritious food a basic human right? Or is it a privilege? And everybody would, next, would say that it is a basic human right. Here are some of the realities. Next. 24% of Africa's population will go to bed hungry tonight. Next. We say that poverty exists not because we can't feed the poor, but because we can't satisfy the rich. Everything we do in Africa is always predicated around the 2% of people at the top of the pile, the really wealthy, and their masses are expected to take care of themselves. Next. We are suggesting that food planning should be pro-poor. The whole focus on the development of, of a food structure Whilst we have spiritual development, our focus is really on nutritional development. And the more that we can give people hope, the greater chance we have of being able to bring those that are errant, bring them back to God and bring back to their faith. Next. We need to ensure our children's future. And that is fundamental in terms of what the African Eden Project stands for. Next. There is a prediction that we've had uh, checked uh, and evaluated by actuaries, we believe that by 2030, 350 million people in Africa are going to be facing starvation and almost certain death. Now, that's pretty scary. Because we've got to look at the harsh African reality when it comes to, to, to food. Next. 256 million people will go to bed hungry tonight. 13 million of those people live in South Africa. Next. Hunger kills more people every year than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Every minute of every hour of every day, eight children who are under five years old will die. That's 4.6 million children will die unnecessarily. 
children who are undernourished can expect to be sick for as much as 160 days of the year, 44% of the time they can be sick. And our life expectancy, the 20 worst performing countries are all African. The reality of the situation is, is whilst the rest of the world has an, an average age of 79, we still have one at 53. And it's largely because people just don't have the opportunity to get the best quality food uh, possible. Next. If you have a look at this, uh, this is the volume of net exports of food staples between 1976 and 2008. And it doesn't matter where you are, east, west, southern or central Africa, there is a dramatic reduction in the amount of staple food that we are, are actually selling. Next. Here is a fact. Africa is now producing less food, 10% less food than we did in 1960. And in 1960, there was only 277 million of us. Now there's 1.2 billion. Um, of us. The demand for food has doubled since 2010 and will double again by 2030. So if we think we're behind the eight ball, we really have got a massive challenge ahead of us. Next. By 2050, there are going to be another 2.2 billion or more of us on the planet and 60% of them will have come from Africa. There's another additional 1.3 billion people by 2050. Next. Currently, we import $35 billion worth of food every single year, and that's estimated to rise by $110 billion by 2025. Now, here's the fact. The reality is the rest of the world will not have that $110 billion worth of food in order to supply Africa. So we've got to find an African solution to an African problem. Next. These are the numbers of hunger around the world, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll see that in Africa, there's 256 million people, and in Asia, there's 515 million people. Next. So 50% of the world's population was in those three areas, but 92% of the world's hungry are in, either in Africa or in Asia, and we have the ability to be able to make change. Next. Kofi Annan once said that uh, the world's population needs to be fed in Africa. Our continent is, is well positioned to be able to do that. We've got the resources. The fact is, we just don't have the political will to get this thing done. We've got to seize this opportunity now. Next. By 2030, the size of the food and agricultural business in Africa will reach $1 trillion. Um, if you want to make money, this is the sector to be in. Just to put that into some kind of perspective, Africa does 100 billion US dollars per year. And the World Bank suggests that an investment in agriculture has gotten 11 times greater, more effective chance of reducing poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa than growth in any other sector. A very critical point. The opportunity for us to become wealthy as Africans will come in our ability to be able to deal with, with food security. So I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes just talking about the African Eden Project. Next. What the African Eden Project is a plan designed around increasing our ability to feed ourselves. And once we're able to do that, then we can then feed the world and give food security for the world. Next. This is a concept plan that we've developed over 12 years, and it's ultimately to feed the world and save the planet. Next. So ultimately, what we're looking to do is to build um, agri-parks, what we call elite agri-energy industrial parks, all across the continent of Africa over, over the next 15 years. Next. We're going to build 150 agri-parks across the African continent. Next. We've written what is called the Project Charter, and it's a 15-year plan. We've discussed it with NEPAD, the uh, United Nations, and the World Bank and uh, also the AU, and we've got their unequivocal support in terms of our ability to go to the vast majority of food. I don't know where everybody knows this, that 92% of all food in Africa is grown and uh, by subsistence farmers. And if we consider what's happening with, with uh, climate change, this, the most significant impact that climate have, ch change will have on our farmers will be at the subsistence level. So what we developed was a solution that uh, we've, we've gone and we've been very blessed in that we've raised the necessary capital in order to achieve the goal over the next 15 to 20 years. And we have 
various professional companies in order to be able to do this. And this is about bringing hope to the world by creating an African solution. Next. We had um, actuaries evaluate uh, uh, the, the model that we've developed. As I said, it's taken 12 years and it was by an actuary said the most important humanitarian project on the planet. So whilst I'm talking about uh, um, agriculture and food security, in fact, what we are is a rural development agency. Next. If one looks at the focus of where is the economy in the rural areas, it's firstly in mining, it's secondly in agriculture. Next. It's also tourism and, and we've added health because the one thing that doesn't exist in, in the rural areas in the most parts of the country is, uh, of the continent, unfortunately, is, um, is the health sector. And then more importantly, all the infrastructure necessary in order to make those four legs of the table successful, we have significant technologies and, and uh, relationships with companies all over the world for us to be able to create something of consequential difference. Next, please. So whilst our, our focus is on food security, our goal is to increase the quantity and the quality of the food that we produce across the African continent. Next. But how do we do it? We do it following is what we call a new age focus. We didn't want to try and find a way that, that allows us to, to tweak the way that we farm or the way we get the food to market. What we want to do is revolutionize the way we do it. And the first thing is, is we're an environmental company first and foremost. Everything that we do must have a, a positive environmental impact. Secondly, we're an agri-tech company. There are very few uh, uh, governments in Africa that realize that farming is a science whilst it used to be an art. So we have 117 different technologies that allow us to radically change the way we do it. Three, we're a waste management company and that will become uh, uh, very important to understand in the next slide. Four, is we're in the complete food value chain. If we have a complete food value chain, then those 20 companies that the previous speaker was spoken about can have zero impact on our ability to mo monitor, manage, and create the, the, the wealth opportunities for ourselves. Next. And next is the three Ps. Everything we do has got to be uh, based on the three Ps. Next. And the three Ps are everything we do must be good for the people. It must be kind to the planet and it must be profitable. And this is the point everybody is talking about. Being profitable makes us sustainable. It's not a sin to, be, to, 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 to make a profit. Um, we've done it uh, for, for the eons. So I'd like to just touch on the point of food security, the myth, the fact, and the reality. Next. Everybody has heard the myth that by 2050, we need to be producing 70% more food to feed almost 10 billion people. That is a myth. The fact is, we currently already produce enough food to feed 14 billion people. Next. However, the reality is by 2027, we'll, we'll not be producing enough food for the hungry. The reality is, is the entire production of food has been focused at the wrong end of the market and the vast majority of the people, people on the ground on, on not getting access to, to food. And the main reason for this is these are statistics out of South Africa. You will see that 30%, 31% of all the food we produce goes to waste before it gets to market. And that's a total cost of 61.5 billion rand a year that goes to, the wa goes to waste. Just to put that in some kind of perspective, the Minister of, of Agriculture has a, a budget somewhere in the order of about 10 billion rand. So 10 billion rand in order to drive commercial farming, but 61.5 billion rand of food goes to waste. Next. Beyond that, we need to be cognizant of the fact that 210 kilograms of food we buy and don't consume. So the harsh reality is 50% of all food grown isn't consumed and goes to waste. So what we've got to do and our focus is just to create the systems that allow us to be able to manage the food waste in order to make those that food available to the to the to, to the vast majority of people who currently are trying to find ways to to keep themselves nourished. I'd like to focus on waste because this is key and fundamental to our solution. We are next. We produce as as human beings about 1000 kilograms of waste per year. Next. 
All of this waste is then sorted out into various fractions and ultimately, next, ends up on a landfill site somewhere. Next. And this is always at a significant cost to government and also obviously from an environmental perspective. Next. I'd like to focus on, on a cow. Next. <clears throat> a cow produces 11 and a half, uh, uh, 11.5 times more waste than we produce. And this is a significant resource, single resource, which allows us to create revenue rather than a cost to the government. Next. So one of the fundamentals is when we develop the model is can we pay the farmers 25% more so that the consumer pays 25% less? And that really is the key and fundamental. So I'm going to talk about a cow because it's easy to understand. If we take a cow, which is one product, and we convert it into something else next, and that something else is meat. We looked at that next, please. We looked and said, in order to create one kilogram of meat, where are the costs? And the costs are fundamentally in electricity, fuel, feed, fertilizer, and antibiotics. And if I could just spend time on antibiotics, 75% of all antibiotics in the world are used for animals, not for humans. So those five elements create 85% of all costs. By the better management of waste, we're able to reduce that 85% down to 15%. So if you can consider that if you're taking a significant cost structure out of the business, you are able to sell at prices that the vast majority of people can afford. And if we take chicken as an example in South Africa, I don't know what the stats are for the whole of the continent, but certainly in South Africa, 68% of people eat chicken because they simply can't afford red meat. So we're going to talk about the cow now specifically. I don't know if people know that 46% of a cow is meat and the rest is waste. And our focus was always on how best do we leverage the amount of waste that exists in order to be able to reduce the price at which we sell meat. Now, in South Africa, 12% of the land mass is good to grow food, only 12%. Yet we take 30% of that 12% and we grow feed for animals. And that can't be a sustainable model if you consider 256 million people in Africa and 13 million in, uh, people in South Africa go to bed hungry every single night. So a fundamental of, of the model that we have developed is, can we produce feed from waste in order that we can free up the land currently that we're growing feed to grow food? So from a cow, we produce from its, its waste, electricity, diesel, fertilizer, and we reclaim the water. So if we had to, what we call a development center, and we have 40,000 cows in a development center, I can create 50 megawatts of power, 65 million liters of biodiesel, and 35,000 tons of fertilizer and reclaim whatever water is there and put that back in the system. And a cow can drink anything between uh, 15 and 60 liters of water a day. So this allows us ultimately to be able to take our meat and to be able to sell it uh, at, a, at, a, at a cheaper price. One, two, it's obviously a better quality product. Next. Now, from the 56% the, uh, of, uh, 40, uh, 54% of the animal, excuse me, that is waste, we have created an enormous opportunity for us to, 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 to leverage off that waste and create significant amounts of revenue. And I can say from this information is we currently produce four and a half times more money from the waste than we do from the meat. In fact, our meat has become the waste. Next. So we have a value proposition that ensures success. We set up an agri park and it's our version of an ag agri park. We take a 200 kilometer radius around that park and we get involved in next organized high density farming. Now, what I mean by this is that if, if I, I don't know whether this, this information is, is known to everybody, 85% of all the farms in the world are two hectares or less. Yet in Africa, if you don't have a thousand hectares, you're not considered a farmer. So I'm going to focus on cows because that's the nature of, of, of the business whilst we're involved in all elements of farming. Right? We work with or become the feed producer from waste in order to feed our animals. Next, we work with the food producers or we become the food producers. And where you've got land that you can, you can uh, not grow food or grow animals, we grow biomass. Because the reality is, is the vast majority of biomass we have 
on the African continent enables, enables us to be able to produce significant amounts of energy. And we're currently selling the biomass into the rest of the world in order for them to produce energy, yet we have a shortfall of 90 gigawatts of energy across the continent of Africa. And somewhere in there is the part of the problem that we're talking uh, about. So the nature of what we do is to create the best quality meat and, and, uh, and vegetables and get it to the market. Next. And we get it to the, 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 the consumer, wherever that consumer is. And we are the retailer as well as the logistics company called Diversity to get that product to market. Next. Now, seven out of 10 people in Africa don't have access to electricity. So if you consider the situation that we're faced with, this model that I've presented to you here produces an enormous amount of, next, waste. From that waste, we create our own energy, our own fuel, our own electricity, our own feed and our own fertilizer, and also our own biochar, which allows us to be able to claim back from the rest of the world because we are, are taking carbon and we can quantify how much of that we're sequestrating. We can then get the rest of the world to pay us because we're putting carbon back into the earth. Next. Now, the more we increase the volume of organic food that we produce, not only for ourselves, but for the entire, for the entire planet, the more value we bring back into the, the, the value chain. And ultimately, as I said at the beginning, our focus is on rural development. The vast majority of business that is created in the rural areas is owned by somebody near a city. Our bottle turns it upside down. The real wealth stays with the people on the ground. So waste and the production of energy is a significant portion of what we do. So we create that. And from that waste, we create significant amounts of diesel, biodiesel, fuel, uh, jet A1. And then we take the remaining biomass and we convert it to feed, which allows us to create a significant industry feeding all animals. Now, I just want to, I'm going to qualify this. Because we make so, money, so much money from the waste, we're able to take all of that feed and provide it to all of our farmers for free. Again, I just want to talk 72% of that 85% is tied up in the feed that we put into um, our animals. Okay? And then from the, the waste of the animals, we create our own electricity. So you can see this vertically integrated system that we develop. Next. From all of the waste, we create all our own organic fertilizer. And I want to just put this into some kind of perspective. The, the world uses about 100 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare. In Africa, we use only eight. So we're only using 8% of what the rest of the world is use, utilizing in fertilizer. And we've got enormous amounts of organic material that we can convert into fertilizer. And if we do that, our studies have shown that we increase the amount of food we produce by 300% without having to cut down trees and, 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 uh, and create more farmlands. So all of this produce that is controlled, we bring into our agri-park and it then comes into diversity is responsible for the conversion and the creation of the brands and taking these brands to the market somewhere. And that market is, is controlled by us and we take that to market. So it's a vertically integrated system that we need nobody's influence. And I'm talking the Monsantos and all of the, uh, the uh, organizations who currently um, are making fertilizer. We currently in Africa pay between six and 10 times more than other developing countries for fertilizer, simply because business, big business, whose philosophy is all about profit at all costs, is charging us way, way too much for the fertilizer. Next. Each agri-park that we create will create something in the order of about 15,000 true, sustainable, long-term jobs. Next. Now, just to put this into some kind of perspective, we want to sell meat in the rural areas between 29 and 39 rand a kilo, or between two and three US dollars, and in the metropolitan areas, between 39 and 59 rand a kilo. Now imagine what price, how much more meat could we get? How many more people could we get to eat meat if the prices were at 50, the most expensive cut of meat at 59 rand a kilo in the, in the metropolitan areas? Each of our agri parks uh, uh, creates something in the order of about 14 billion rand or 1 billion US dollars, more or less, per agri park. And we want to build 150 across the continent. So the one billion, one trillion rand is all going to come from within, within the African Eden Project. So we call this true radical economic transformation. It's just that it's the elite way. 
it's in the best interest of everybody rather than the the uh, the elites next please so where are we going to do this i'm going to just run through this quickly there are seven sites and in fact i was blessed to have a meeting just the other day so we're going to increase this to eight sites around the country the first is in the western cape and it will run all the way up into southern namibia the next is in the Lanseri area we're actively involved in the in the development of the uh, the uh, uh, smart city there makado which will service botswana as well as zimbabwe uh, and Gumazi site that will service uh, Mozambique and then coming down into northern uh, uh, Namibia, then Freyhate. And the last is a combined cross border uh, thing between Harry Smith, Lesotho, and uh, Zastron. What we have is, is a situation where Lesotho's got lots of water and very little land, and the Free State's got lots of land but no water. So we're looking at the opportunity to bring water from uh, Lesotho. To a million hectares of land in the free state and the produce then comes back into those three areas in order to service uh, uh, the, the community but then also to service the Lesotho populace where they got 2.3 million people desperate for food next then we have three sites in namibia the first is in the, uh, the central part of the of the country the southern part, which will join in with the, the agri park that we're doing, and then a super agri park that we are creating um, in the northern uh, parts, which will also serve as Botswana, the northern parts of Botswana, and also uh, the southern part of Angola. Next, please. Now, what we're doing is setting up an SEZ and a desalination plant to create all the water we acquire in order to service the central and southern parts um, of the country. Next. Now, we're getting involved in smart city development, but our version of a smart city is not about uh, uh, all the technologies. It's about a city of smart people. So what we're creating in that area is a, the Agricultural University of Southern Africa, the Medical University of Southern Africa. I'm amazed that we, we pay 440 million rand to bring Cuban doctors into the country who don't get anything of that money, firstly, and secondly, they can't speak English. That doesn't make any sense to me. So we're going to create our own uh, uh, farmers, the future farmers, and we're going to create our own future doctors, right? And also um, um, colleges for, for people that are involved in blue collar uh, uh, type of work. This will create, this three um, agri parks will create employment opportunities for 200,000 people. It's almost 10% of the, the Namibian populace. Next, please. And then I want to go to the core of where um, our work is, and this is in the, um, the Zambian region. Now, if you take a super agri park that we're developing in the northern province, it has six neighboring countries. You've got the DS, uh, 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 Congo, you've got Tanzania, you've got Malawi, you've got Mozambique, and you've got Zimbabwe literally on the border of that super agri park. And then on the western side, we're creating another agri park that will deal also with Zimbabwe. The top end of of, uh, um, of Botswana, and then also into more the central and northern parts of Angola. Now, the population of those countries is 233 million people around the the, 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 the northern one, and on the western side, excuse me, next is a total of 33 million people. So collectively, with all these agri parks, the first 12 that we're talking about, that caters to 28% of Africa's population, and we're going to be rolling these out in the next two to three years. Next, please. Now, we have a very simple philosophy in our organization. Whilst big business is about profit at all cost, ours is about making uh, a difference whilst making profit. And we have the simple philosophy is that everybody stands under the same sun. It has been said and has become quite vocal recently is, is that a rising tide lifts all boats. So we 100% committed to transformation across the African continent, not at the expense of somebody else, but as in an inclusivity way. Right? So our mentality is all about creating an ecosystem that allows for the integration of everything that we talk about across the technologies across the nature of the business and getting away from the silo uh, uh, mentality. 
We'll engage with all the municipalities in an area. We engage with the cooperatives, very critical uh, um, success story. In, in South Africa, we've created 22,000 cooperatives since 1994, of which 126 actually have turned into a business. All right, we engage with the churches, very, very important. We have too many churches, their focus is inward rather than outward. Now, we want to support them by giving them opportunities to look after their people. We want to engage with traditional leadership, critically important. They got the land, they got the people, and they got the need. However, they don't have the support. And our focus is, is developing with them through the AU, which is responsible for the continental free trade zone. We engage with the communities directly. We have a simple philosophy. Every single person must have a job. Every single person must have hope and must have the opportunity to be able to create opportunities for themselves and for the communities and for the region as a whole. We're, we're engaged with the, the youth and women who currently are, are the ones that are responsible and the ones that have the least opportunity for, for growth. Our focus is always um, in that environment. And we engage with NGOs. You'll see from that, that we're not talking about governments. Our focus is getting the endorsement of government and then allowing us to deal with the people in order to create a solution that best suits the people rather than the political elites within uh, uh, any government in any country. And I'm not, we are apolitical when we come to this. So part of what we do, and this is important to understand, is, is that we build our own schools. We build our own colleges. We build our own churches, our community centers. We create our own health systems. We build our own retail and wholesale environment. We build our own sport fields. We fix our own roads. Right? And we fix our own water, sanitation, and waste because that's the nature of who we are and what we do. All of that is funded from waste. This is not about creating money. This is about using money more efficiently and uh, people ask, what am I trying to be? I said, I want to be a monthly philanthropist. Ultimately, what we're looking to do is to ensure that the, we make a heck of a lot of money and then redistribute that, put that out into the hands of people to give them the hope that they require. And if we do that, we can bring people back to the, to the faith. We are the, 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 uh, the most faith-driven continent, but we've got the opportunity to double those numbers because if we give people hope, we give them opportunities. So we're the only organization that's involved in harmony and balance, right? We're all about rural development. And there are very few organizations that are truly involved in rural development. Next. We understand farming. We appreciate the beneficiation and the importance of that. And by the way, when we talk about this, it's not only about farming. It's also about mining and also about, about uh, uh, tourism. Right? We understand waste. We're in fact a waste management company that looks like an abattoir, but in fact, it's, it's uh, the opportunity that we get from the waste. We create our own energy that allows us to close the gap between us as a developing continent and the developed world. We're very kind to the environment. And last and most important is we create an economy where currently an economy doesn't exist. Our focus, we are blessed to be, have had the opportunity to get involved uh, with the Confina and, and his organizations. And we're looking to be the catalyst to be able to take these two organizations, uh, Global Roundtable and the, and the Fund for Jesus, and to be able to take that into Africa with the, the power, the might, and the financial ability to be able to bring about the change that we all yearn for. So that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I have stayed within my 20 minutes is all about the African Eden project and the role that we want to play across the African continent. I uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Ball, and um, my brother. We're working together on this project, and we really want to see Africa transformed and uh, being the breadbasket of the world. And this is a big solution, and um, and the way we can change society and the world by coming with concrete solutions, concrete problems. You land it, you know, as I said earlier on, you can fly a, a jumbo jet in the sky. If you can't land it, it doesn't help anyone that much. The whole purpose of flying, moving from one destination is to land into the next destination. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I think we've run out of time. We're gonna take a very few questions. 
and give each panelist one minute to respond and then go back quickly uh, towards closing our program. And if we have questions, we're not gonna take comments, just questions. And uh, we will then uh, take, give each panelist one minute to respond. And uh, from there we're gonna move towards closure. Uh, yes, we have uh, several questions, Your Excellency. Um, I'll start from the first presentation of uh, yes, corporate you can, bonds. You can, read, you, you can read them. Can I ask the panelists to write the, the questions down? All right, and then yes. we, yeah, we will read all the questions. They'll note them down and then from there and respond to the questions one after the other. And then after that, we will wrap up the program. Thank you, Excellency. Saramuni. Thank you. So uh, the first question is corporate bond. Is this classified as equity, grant, or debt? And uh, the other question is, is there a solution out there geared for willow businesses? This is still on the first presenter. And um, uh, what can be done to help such businesses because uh, because uh, they contribute immensely to economies and create employment. Uh, the third question is, does the investor carry the risk if the business does not, does not succeed? So that question. Uh, we also have another question. Um, what role would cryptocurrency play in terms of business finance uh, funding? And uh, the, another question also, would it be typically a lot harder for SMEs to raise capital through the ventures, the venture financing due to their credit worthiness? Uh, the last question here is what happens when the father, uh, yeah, what, I think this is for the next speaker. What happens when the father has given you a vision so huge that you find trouble even getting it off the ground? Uh, the other question we have here, what steps do you take to stop um, enriching one person, which is the pastor, but to grow the Christianity economic, the Christian economic level, to stop uh, the say uh, as poor as a tech mouse. Uh, the other question is, um, um, is it possible to get the contact of a philanthropist? I think someone was asking for contact of philanthropist. Uh, the other one is, um, what model do we adopt as GDR to leverage on our global platform to grow national wealth? And another question we have here is, what are the actions that you should individually take to help, I think, the person meant to help in poverty? And uh, the other one is um, someone asking, uh, this is good uh, to have an African solution to an African problem. What has been done so far to attain that uh, regarding the project? And also someone is also requesting if it's possible to, to, to also uh, go to children and present the same approach. Uh, that would be all your evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Saramuni. So I'll open now to the panelists to start answering. Whoever is ready can go for it. And you can answer any question you are comfortable with and leave the rest to other panelists. Your Excellency Lebu, you wanna start? Kindly unmute. Thank you very much, convener. So just, there was a question around rural folk and their access to finance. It is a problem. Um, it's a challenge that needs to be thought about from both ends, which means from the end of the business itself and from the end of the investor. And it is there because there's often a mismatch of expectations. So there are potential solutions out there. They're not perfect. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, these include uh, microfinance institutions. They include uh, development finance institutions. Um, but it is a problem that is acknowledged and Africa is uh, a victim, so to speak of this, but it is not a simple solution. The, same, the second question was around 
why is it typically harder for SMEs to raise capital and, and specifically through debentures? Um, SMEs struggle um, due to not only credit worthiness, it's, it's also sometimes um, there's little to no security in the business, because a small business that is a survivalist, so it is not necessarily thriving. And sometimes the, the SMEs often don't understand what funders are looking for. So again, it speaks to that gap between the business itself and the funders. There is a lot of work that does need to be done by all role players. And I think there's a lot of work that has been done and is good work. I'll address one more question around corporate bonds. Those sit typically sit on the debt side of things, uh, but it, it can sit on the mezzanine side, which means it just depends on the features of some of those instruments. I think I, I will leave some of the questions to some of the other panelists because they speak to more than one presentation. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Lebu. Uh, Excellency Keith, you want to come in now? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I was struggling to hear all the questions, but I, I think I heard a question which said, what if the vision that God gives us is so big we don't even know where to start? And uh, yes. let me tell you, every vision God gives us is so big we don't know where to start because God's vision is so much bigger than anything we can catch hold of. But what he does, he says, use what you've got available and start moving. And unless you start moving, you, you have no chance of God actually bringing you in contact with the people you need to come in contact, bringing you in, in, in contact with the people who are going to help you to take that vision or that uh, project forward towards the vision. So it's getting going is important. Secondly, prayer is absolutely vital if you are going to achieve anything. Unless you give the time with God to prayer, listening to what he's saying, giving it back to him to get understanding so it's a dialogue with God, giving it, getting it back, giving it, getting it back, because it starts to shape it, you actually won't find the door starting to open. But when you start moving, and you start praying, there is no vision that is too big for anyone on this, this uh, conference, this Zoom call, to achieve. So uh, that's, that's my answer to that particular question. Thank you, Excellency Keith. You know, the vision is so big. Just listen to the vision of the, of the Africa Eden Project uh, that has potential to create more than 2.3 2 million jobs in the continent, African solutions by Africans and with creating 150 agri parks with each generating $1 billion revenue. There is no company like that in Africa. There is no institution that, that those revenues will be bigger than the entire GDP of the continent. So, and this is, this is what we're speaking about, about fundamental transformation that transform lives and jobs, and it's bigger. From, from the perspective of a, a, a mind that ha, does not have faith, it, it, it seems impossible. But here yeah, it is uh, being practicalized. And when the Lord spoke about the vision of the Global Fund for Jesus being in the largest fund in the face of the planet, in cash, in shares, in property, uh, it, it was unthinkable, it's unthinkable, but we can see it come to pass and many other things. So if it, if it ain't, if it's not big, uh, it's not God, because our God is big. He owns everything. And our challenges that we face are big, and they need big solutions and big minds and big faith. And, and I think we're getting that. The body of Christ is getting closer and closer to that. And because of the global network that GBR and JFFJ have, we're starting to connect as the body of Christ and finding solutions together. This is very, very exciting. Um, Your Excellency, uh, uh, um, uh, Minister, Honorable Minister, do you have some uh, uh, input to make? My, my, my comment would be brief. 
and it relates to, I just want to challenge uh, Christians around the globe. Those who are inspired to volunteer their services, they should register with GBR, indicating the skills sets they have so that there is an opportunity for skills uh, match for those who want to volunteer and work. Of course, uh, it may not just be 100% voluntary work. It could be uh, a system where the host organization, host business would contribute some accommodation towards the upkeep of the, 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 the volunteer or the, the mentor or the coach. So I, I want to challenge people to volunteer and register so that uh, GBR can create a database of who is where with what capacities. Uh, finally, I, I want to make comment regarding the size of the vision. Yes, the vision is big. It must be big for it to succeed. When the apostles were sent out, they were told, start in Jerusalem. So we must start in our own Jerusalems, wherever we are, whether it's in South Africa, in Botswana, in Nigeria, in Kenya, wherever we are we must start with our own Jerusalems. Start in our neighborhood and create capacity within or give a reorientation of what we want to do at a national level and then broaden it to create uh, coalitions and uh, linkages with others in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, Minister, this is greatly ap 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 appreciated. We agree, God has created a platform with GBR and G5G to link us. Uh, this is a multi-denominational platform, multinational. It's kingdom owned platform, it's owned by God for us to work together, to create synergies, to give and to take what we don't have, to give what we have and share and develop those that have no capacity. It first, we share information and knowledge, and we share networks, and we share skills, and we share resources, and we share opportunities. So, and this is a starting point. And yes, uh, the first thing you can invest your, in, in, if when you volunteer, it's an investment into, into self. It puts you in a system where people see your capabilities, where people see uh, uh, your, your, where you can add value and create opportunities. If you are not employed, you'll find yourself employed. If you want to start business, you'll find yourself knowing people who can connect you to business opportunities. Thank you for that, Your Excellency, Honorable Minister. Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Jonathan Ball, your, 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 rep, your final points. Thank you, my brother. Um, I, I wanted to make, make a couple of points. Uh, you know, Africa has always been focused on poverty alleviation. And by its very definition, it means that we're going to, to reduce the amount of poverty, but we're still going to be poor. Our focus is always on abundance. It's about the creation of abundance and sharing that abundance. And it's time for Christians to stop turning the other cheek. It's time for us to take charge of what happens across the world. And, and we've allowed the, the, the bad actors to control what we do, and it's time for us to make that change, and I strongly believe that. Now, I want to focus on the questions that uh, Sarah Munya uh, um, raised. The first thing is this. The banking world does not support SMMEs and small-scale uh, uh, small business people. They don't. One only has to look at the land bank currently. One only has to look at the land bank in, in uh, Namibia, technically in deep, deep trouble. Um, and the impact of that is translating across 28% of farmers out there. The small scale farmer, the small scale business person, the entrepreneur cannot necessarily find the money. Now, one of the key things that the African Eden Project is looking to do is to create digital stock exchanges across the continent of Africa that affords us the opportunity to be able to make funding available for those small scale businesses, which is more about the uh, ability to create abundance rather than the profitability and the returns that may come from that. We believe that profit, uh, businesses should be profitable, but the reality of the situation is put money into people's hands, gives them the opportunity with the necessary mentorship to be able to translate into something of significant value. So we wanna break down those old barriers um, that exist within the banking world. 
in order to create that now. Within each of these, these uh, um, um, stock exchanges that we create, we create trade platforms that allow us to be able to sell produce from one country to another. It's, it's beyond me to, that we are buying rice as an example in a country like Thailand when we could be producing it locally in Angola as an example and swapping the food out. So we want to be able to barter the produce that we have. So we're creating the infrastructure necessary to be able to, to support that. And what we're looking to do is rather the, the, the be the partner and the mentor of these small businesses, because if we think that we're going to come back from COVID by focusing on big business, forget about it. It's small businesses are the biggest employees in the uh, employers in the world. And we've got to create those opportunities post COVID, but we start today rather than in, at, at a time when COVID is less, is less fearful for us. So we, we committed to, to, to creating and supporting small businesses because they are the future employers of, of the world. But we do this across borders. We don't see the borders and think that what we do in South Africa should be different from what we do in Namibia. We should be creating the opportunity for those links to be created so that we can, we can uplift those countries who, whose people are coming into, into South Africa. We, you know, there's... I want to just put this in some kind of perspective. $160 billion worth of money is recirculated from the, uh, uh, from the rest of the world into the diaspora of, of, uh, of, of uh, Africa. $160 billion is redistributed. Right? We need people here to create the $160 billion that stays within the continent of Africa rather than, than uh, the wealth being created in the wealthy, uh, wealthy countries. We're going to stop being... Uh, apologists for what we do. We've got the youngest population. We've got the, the climate that we require. We've got all the mineral rights. And what we need to do is to create small businesses that benefit from the things that we do, rather than focusing on the, the top five in every category, uh, some international company that has, has come and taken the value out of our hands. I don't Thank want that so to much, sound too brother. political, but, but uh, it is, is something very close to my heart. And I can see Keith, you, uh, Keith uh, agrees with me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, my brother, Jonathan, for that input. You say we must have dominion mentality. What has given us dominion uh, to be fruitful and multiply and to take over these sectors of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of, uh, of, of government. Kingdom is about all these sectors put together and uh, influence the economy, influence education, influence politics, influence, and but the economic mountain is the key. He who controls the economy controls politics, control what goes around uh, uh, in, in, in education. So it's a very, very strategic mountain for us uh, to be involved in and to ensure that uh, we land it and that the children of God, the, the kingdom citizens uh, are in control of that mountain. Then they can control policy, they can control regulation, they can control trade and everything that goes uh, around it in a kingdom way that it benefits uh, everyone, not only a few uh, that um, uh, to, at the expense of, uh, of many. Thank you very much. I see we've got other hands, but unfortunately we've run out of time. We will not be able to uh, take those uh, hands and, um, and um, um, you can send those uh, 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 questions by email, we'll try and send responses to you by, by email. Uh, the office will deal with them. So we will uh, now uh, wrap up our program and um, go to the Malawi to get Mr. Richard Chongo to do offering. We'll give him two minutes and then uh, get Mr. Fumani to do Velu's moment for two minutes and uh, get, get, get Mr. Kudagwashe Mashiro in Zimbabwe uh, to also do announcements and vote of thanks in, in uh, three minutes. And then we'll then go to Kenya for the uh, closing prayer to, Ms., to Pastor Paul Muhami in, in Kenya. That will end our session. So we have uh, exceeded our time. And so we will uh, move very fast now. Your Excellency, Mr. Richard Chongo in Malawi, are you there? Yes. Thank you, Excellency. Um, and thank you so much uh, to all our presenters uh, for the beautiful presentation. We have learned a lot. So in the next two minutes, I just want to encourage all of us um, on the goodness of, of 
thanksgiving and worshiping the Lord through offering. If we read in, um, in Proverbs 11, verses 24-25, it says, One yet another withholds what he should give and only suffers to be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. And in Hebrews 13, verse 16, it says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So I just want to encourage uh, all of us that when we are blessed by God, it is only good and fair that we also bless others. We also feel that in our heart, we want to thank God for he is good in our lives. So when we give, we want to show that we are very happy, we are thankful, and we are praising him. So it's a form of thanksgiving. It's a form of worshiping God. And the, the scripture that I've read is that the one that gives more will he himself be given more even more than what he has given. But the one who with hearts, you find that he's not given anything. Even when we read in the, uh, in the Bible, on the, like the parable of the, of the talents, the one that was given more, invested that, and he, 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 he got more than from, 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 from what he invested. And the one who got one talent, he buried it and thought that maybe the, the master did not did not love him and did not produce anything more. And because he just buried it, he did not invest, there was nothing that he got. So just to to say that when when we are given, whether it's more or less, we should show that we are thankful to God by offering, so that the offering should also help other people. So the offering that we give help the the house of god so that we can continue doing the work of god the offering that we we give they also help other people like those that are in uh in need those that are in prison the widows the orphans so when even when we read in the bible when james says true region is when we go and visit the the orphans the widows so basically it just gives it just tells us that god does not have hands the physical hands that he can go and give the food to the people god works through us so our offering helps to promote the the work of god of god and also helps to feed and help the people that cry to god each and every day for help so i just want to encourage all of us that when we have this time for offering let us give willingly let us give freely let us give while knowing that we are worshiping god and we are praising praising god and it is a it is a form of thanksgiving uh from from our hearts thank you so much thank you very much your excellency and the offering we take uh, goes to the poor uh, it goes to the global fund for jesus and to fund the programs of the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the disadvantaged. We support uh, NGOs. Uh, we give hampers uh, to students uh, in schools, uh, to uh, indigent families. And therefore, when we give, we lend to God. And we really, really are in that mission of making impact in the lives of, of the people. The uh, banking details are were on the screen, and you can find them also on the website of the Global Fund for Jesus at dot com or on the website of the Global Business Roundtable. Thank you very much. We're now gonna move to a Velu's moment, Mr. Fumani Shikwambani. Thank you very much, uh, program director. Uh, I think I'll, I'll only use a minute because uh, his Excellency, Mr. Jonathan Ball, and uh, the former minister, I think they spoke 
uh, they gave the crux of what I wanted to deliver tonight uh, on love. So I'll just read one scripture to remind us about the value of love and so that we can uh, sum up the session. I read Deuteronomy 7, 9, and it reads, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Fumani, for that value of love, loving God and loving your neighbor, uh, and, uh, and also keeping his commandments, uh, which is really, really important. Thank you, thank you for that value, which we share, which we hold dear. Uh, one is one of our fundamental values at GBR. Yesterday, we dealt with the value of collaboration, working together, not competing, supporting each other, and today we're dealing with this value of love. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Can we take the announcements now and the vote of thanks from His Excellency, Mr. Gudawashe Mashiro in Zimbabwe? Your Excellency, Mr. Mashiro, are you there? Yes, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. I will start with the announcement and I'll end with the vote of thanks. I uh, kindly note that the GBR camp is continuing daily until the 24th of February, and it will be held at the following times. In the morning, from 0400 hours to 0500 hours CAT, this will be for individual devotions from 0,500 hours to 0,700 hours CAT. We'll be having corporate prayers from, from 1,800 hours to, to 2,300 hours CAT. We'll be having our evening sessions. This will be for holistic development sessions. We are all encouraged to invite people within our networks to benefit from this session and would like to comment that uh, today there were a number of people, which is a reflection that we are inviting more people to come and join. Please note that the GBR session that usually take place every Saturday online from 1400 hours to 1600 hours will resume on the 5th of March, 2021. You can catch up on all GBR prayer camp sessions by visiting the camp website on gbrcamp.com. We can also watch it on Facebook and YouTube as well. Please note that GBR worship DVDs and CDs are now available on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, and other digital music stores. Catch a new thing uh, on the GBR TV show or on RTM, that is free to a channel, TBN, TBN Mzanzi, for those who are not yet members, to become a member of Global Business Roundtable, you just register on our website, www.globalbusinessroundtable.com. The GBR and the GFFJ leadership remind all GBR members and all GFFJ ambassadors to set aside every Wednesday from 600 hours to 1800 hours from January to November as a day of prayer and fasting. A list of prayer items are available weekly on the GBR website. Now I'll move on to the vote of thanks. We'd want to thank our convener for leading the session. We'd also want to thank our speakers starting with uh, 
His Excellency Rolane for the to, for the first uh, presentation, which came to us. He mainly touched on business finance, and we would like to thank you for that. And he gave us insights on how we can finance our business. We also want to thank our second panelist, Mr. Keith Tripp, for a powerful presentation which came where he was enlightening us on the role of Christians in creating the new economy. He really outlined what kind of economy we would want and how we as Christians can impact and add value in that economy. We also want to thank our guest, our guest speaker, our former minister from Botswana, Honorable Ezekiel Malefit. Uh, thank you very much. He had a presentation which outlined the potential of churches in developing the world economy. It is really our duty to impact in the world economy as people in the church and as Christians. We also want to thank our guest speaker, Mr. Jonathan Ball, for a powerful presentation which had insights on what's coming ahead. He really touched on how the new project yet to come can impact and transform lives, create opportunities that is post the COVID-19 pandemic. Of interest, he mainly touched on how we can sustain ourselves as Africa through agriculture and other means of sustaining our operations here in Africa. I would also want to thank uh, his Excellency Richard Chonko from Malawi for the offering. I would also want to thank His Excellency Fumani uh, for the veil of love, which he, he gave us. I would also want to thank Pastor Paul, who is going to give us a closing prayer. And most importantly, I would want to thank each and everyone who attended this session and those who are going to invite others to attend the session which we are going to have tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, it's greatly appreciated your vote of thanks and we would like to thank you as well. We are meeting, yes, every morning tomorrow we, where we have our prayers starting at 4 to 5 a.m. We pray individually in our homes, and then we join the Zoom from 5 to 7. So they're very, very intense. Remember, everything starts in the spiritual world. If you don't receive it in the spirit, you can't manifest it uh, in the physical. So the morning sessions are spiritually intense, and that's, that's, those are the sessions that ground you, that focuses you, and then the evening sessions help you to lend it and to receive it and to practicalize it. And tomorrow we will be um, um, having the same sessions in the morning. We'll meet at 5 a.m. after our individual prayers, Central African time. And then we'll meet in the evening at 6 p.m. Uh, for the sessions. Tomorrow we'll be dealing with the mountain of politics, of, gov of governments, as well as leadership. So join us tomorrow and it will be great again as we had a great time today. Lastly, we're gonna then ask His Excellency, uh, Pastor Paul Muhami from Kenya to uh, come forward and close with the prayer for us. Thank you, Your Excellency. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we you can, can hear, hear you, Your Excellency. Yes, you can hear you, you can proceed. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today because of this session we just had, oh God. 
Lord, you've exposed to us that the wealth is in Africa, Father. The wealth of Africa is right here in Africa, Father. Thank you for the very amazing presentations that were done, oh God. That truly confirms uh, Genesis 1 11, where the Bible says that the seed of everything is inside itself, oh God. The wealth of Africa is not in America, is not in Britain, is not in Japan, but is right here in Africa, oh God. Lord, we've been told to stop thinking about poverty eradication and to focus on where we want to go, which is wealth creation, oh Father. You've given us the seed, you've given us the wisdom, and you You've given our convener, His Excellency C. For Museleko, the the vision of where you want to take us, oh God. And I thank you, oh God, because now we have the GFFG, oh God, which has various initiatives across Africa and across the globe. Lord, I pray that, Father, that we now we shall now start speaking in one voice, because you say that whatever we purpose to do as we speak in one voice, oh Father, shall not be impossible to us, oh God. I pray for every one of us who is right here, oh God, that we shall all volunteer our services, our skills, and our resources to make sure that the kingdom comes Come, oh God. Matthew 6 says that thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth, oh Father. I pray that even as we use what you've given us, oh God, that your kingdom shall come down to earth, oh God, because your will shall be done by us, oh Father. I pray for GFG and GBR chapters across the globe, oh God, that we shall all speak in one voice, oh God. And every time we meet, Father, we shall give testimonies of what you're doing in each of the nations, oh Father. I pray for our convener, oh God. I pray for his health. I pray for his team. I pray that you may give him the peace that surpasses human understanding, that nothing shall prevail from the enemy, oh God. I pray for each one of us, oh God, that our, that our presence on us shall make a difference. We are not here to chase money, Father. We are here to make an impact. And this is exactly what we are doing as GBR and GFG, oh God. I pray for every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen, Your Excellency Mohammed amen. from Nairobi. Thank you. You've blessed us with the closing prayer. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Amen. Have a great evening. We shall see you tomorrow in the morning and in the evening for those who are attending the evening. And uh, enjoy. We're going to have a worship song, or one worship song or two, those who love worship uh, before uh, we do. love worship. Uh, so have a great evening and God bless. Have a great evening and God bless. Amen. Excellent.